Welcome everyone. We are joined today by Professor Henry Giroux and we are exceedingly honored that he has taken the time to talk to us. Professor Giroux is one of the founding theorists of critical pedagogy and perhaps the foremost educational thinker of our time. He is currently teaching at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, where he holds the Chair for Scholarship in the Public Interest since 2014 and is the McPherson Institute's Paulo Freire Distinguished Scholar in Critical Pedagogy. He has also previously been a professor at Boston University and Penn State. During a career that has spanned nearly 50 years, he has authored some 70 books on a variety of topics on education, culture, uh, media theory, youth studies, critical theory, and critical pedagogy, obviously, in addition to countless articles and chapters in academic literature. He is also a prolific public intellectual and commentator and regularly contributes to media outlets like Truthout, Counterpunch, and Salon. Again, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us, and we really appreciate it. Oh, I'm, I'm honored to be on the program. Thank you so much. So um, your most recent book, uh, Race, Politics, and Pandemic Pedagogy, came out only in January this year. Um, it's, it's very topical, obviously, because we live in kind of unprecedented times of uh, disruption. But could you just briefly uh, explain what you understand under that, that term, pandemic pedagogy? Well, I, I think one of the things that I was trying to make very clear in this book is that often the pandemic is talked about almost exclusively, as is understandable, in medical terms. And I, I wanted to argue, and I tried to argue in the book, um, that we're really talking about not only a medical pandemic, we're talking about an ideological and political pandemic. It's, separ it's, it's almost impossible to separate the way in which this pandemic has unfolded, the way it's been treated, the consequences, without really talking about education and its failure in many ways. And when I talk about pandemic pedagogy, I'm, I'm particularly talking about a pedagogy that basically trades off what I call a kind of manufactured ignorance. You know, an attempt to basically claim that the only obligations of citizenship are consumerism and to basically undermine the basic institutions and ideologies that make a democracy possible. And so the, the real crisis here is not just medical, the real crisis is a crisis of democracy because what the pandemic has revealed uh, enormous inequities in the failure of neo-global capitalism. And also at the same time has reinforced in my mind, uh, modes of consciousness, modes of education, depoliticizing forms of education that in many ways have given rise to uh, the threat of, of fascist politics all over the globe. And so I wanted to stress how education is central to politics, not merely as a mode of empowerment, Matt's, but also in, in a way that is shaping modes of agency, identification, and social relationships that undermine democracy itself. And so the, the book is kind of a, a, a calling, a siren, so to speak, you know, an attempt to say, hey, look, if we can't address this pandemic in terms of how we change consciousness and address those institutions that now make education central to an oppressive politics, I think we're really in trouble. Right, so, so you do see education being used in, in kind of the rhetoric and people talking about the pandemic. I, I see education being used in, in, in three ways. I see it being used in schools to promote forms of teaching that are utterly technocratic and instrumental, mm. and in many ways undermine uh, the very mission of education as a democratic public sphere. I, I'm not sure what it's like where you are, but here in Canada, the only discussion that seems to take place around public and higher education is how to use Zoom teams and other online forms of education. Uh, th this is really a diversion uh, from talking about the substantive purpose of education. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden we find our back ourselves back to that moment in the 1970s, the 1970s and 50s, 60s, when people like Herbert Marcuse and Madonna were talking about the threat of instrumental rationality, technocratic rationality, that's returned under the pandemic with a revenge. Right. Secondly, it seems to me that we have another issue around education that we need to address. And that is that education is not just simply about schooling. Education has become uh, it, it seems to me part of an image-based oracular culture that is enormously powerful in, in shaping identities, values, social positions, notions of common sense, and legitimating the, the worst dimensions 
of, of, of neoliberalism, two of which are really dreadful. One is that all problems are basically individual problems. Mm. And so therefore, if there's a problem, we have no sense of collective resistance in terms of how to either address it or system understanding of its systemic causes. The second issue is that we've so privatized everything under neoliberalism, it's difficult to translate private considerations and troubles into larger social considerations. Mm. These are de depoliticizing acts of, of education. And they take place in a culture now dominated by the social media, dominated particularly in the United States by a very powerful right-wing media operation that is, is, is uh, basically supported by the Koch brothers, massive right-wing money, and it is the most powerful educational force in the country. And the damage that it does in terms of promoting white supremacy you know, neo-Nazi groups to plunge into the abyss of fascist politics is almost overwhelming. Thirdly, the struggle for education has to be linked to a different kind of language. You know, the left generally, and forgive me for this generalization, has made a terrible mistake over the last few decades because it tends to think that domination is only about economics. Mm. Unlike people like Pierre Bourdieu, Castoriadis, Paulo Freire, John Dewey, you know, who said, hey, look, if you don't have an informed citizenry, you can't have a democracy. And that politics follows culture, meaning that people live in a culture in which they try to understand the nature of their lives and the conditions that bear down on them. That's an educational issue. And, and so it seems to me that that notion of education being both in the schools and outside of the schools opens up a way to talk about education being central to politics and what it means to do that in terms of very specific pedagogical practices that we haven't talked about before and right. certainly not talked about enough. Right, okay. Th this sounds almost, I mean, just to, to cherry pick at a few of the things you've said, and th those are certainly a lot of things. Um, it almost sounds as if you're describing education as kind of a bulwark that exists kind of almost sounds as if you, it's stemming some sort of tide that comes from the what do you call like the neoliberal system and, and now it's just being removed am i understanding you wrong I, I i think that what i'm saying is that one of the things about neoliberalism is it's sort of like the divine right of kings mm. in that it's so powerful and so pervasive that it has basically engulfed the planet. Uh, and, you know, when Margaret Thatcher married Ronald Reagan and they, 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 they gave forth birth to all kinds of dictators everywhere from Erdogan to basically Trump, uh, the basic message was there was no alternative right. to, to liberalism. But right. even worse, Matt, was the assumption that democracy and capitalism were the same thing. And so what I'm getting at is what is the ideological scaffolding through which, for instance, neoliberal policies have been legitimated? And more importantly, if I may say this, in the age of the pandemic, the shroud has been ripped off of neoliberalism. Mm. The massive degree of inequality and suffering that it produces has been revealed by virtue of a virus that is not that is indiscriminate in terms of how it might affect you, but it's very discriminate in terms of how people can deal with it. Mm. That's an economic, political, educational issue. Right. And so it seems to me as neoliberalism has faulted on its promises of meritocracy, rising boats and all that nonsense, we, we find it has shifted gears and it has now shifted into a form of fascist politics in which in order to divert criticisms away, from its broken promises, it now talks about immigrants being the cause of our problems. It now talks about blacks being the cause of our problems. It now has basically aligned itself with a form of white supremacy that basically represents an updated version of fascist politics. I mean, I'm one of these theorists, as you know, may know, uh, that argues that, you know, to say that fascism is dead and is simply a, an historical relic of the past is simply nonsense. I mean, I'm not arguing that Trump was Hitler. 
I'm arguing that we have to be aware and, and alarmed by what we have seen in a fascist past, whether we're talking about the legacy of slavery and the Ku Klux Klan in the United States, or whether we're talking about what happened in, 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 uh, in Chile and what happened in Latin America in the 70s and in the 30s and 40s in Europe. But there, there are lessons to be learned here. And one of the things that neoliberalism does is it flattens historical consciousness. Mm. It erases it. You now, your generation lives in an oracular culture. And in that culture, you live in a culture of immediate. You live in a culture in which speed and time collapse into each other in such a way mm. that questions of memory become a liability. That's a political issue. And it's also an educational issue. Right. Wow. Um, but so just on that last point, do you think that the people who make decisions on educational policy on uh, pedagogies, they are aware of this, of the, so let's say, maybe destabilizing power of memory and history? Oh, I, I, I think that I think that the people who control Fox News, the Murdoch Empire, if, right. you, if you may, they define themselves as an educational empire. Mm. And it, they they say that in parties, you know, in private engagements, they know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly what they're pushing. I mean, they know much more so than the left that questions of ideology and education matter. I mean, these are propaganda machines. You know, these, these are basically adjuncts of government power. They're not making policy. They're shaping it. They're not making, they're, they're not putting people in jail. They're saying we don't need jails when we can colonize people's minds. You know? I mean, who needs a jail, right? I mean, the prisons actually begin outside of the carceral state now in some ways or extended from them, sorry. Uh, so yeah, I think they know exactly what they're doing. I mean, I, I look, let, let's be realistic. Even at the level of commercial culture, Advertising is an immensely pedagogical institution, mm. as you know. It delivers people's subjectivities, identifications, values, and interests to basically corporations. That's what it does. Only now they deliver notions of agency to corporations, mm. agencies that are depoliticized, that are lost, that are alienated, that are isolated. We live in a society in which the social has collapsed. Right. And when the social collapses, all of a sudden you have a massive uh, uh, e ecosystem of what I call social atomization. Mm. And that's dangerous. People can't connect. They don't know how to translate individual troubles into systemic considerations. And all of a sudden, a culture emerges that is endemic to and supportive of what I think is a fascist politics. Right. You look to the strong man. You look for simplistic answers. It's easy to blame Blacks. Right. It's easy to blame immigrants. Oh, they're taking our jobs. You know, they're doing all this nonsense that doesn't exist. Now they're and giving it's, us COVID as well. It's what? Now they're giving us COVID as well. Yeah, now they're giving us COVID. Or, 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 or George Soros has mobilized all the immigrants of the world to invade the West. It's a Jewish conspiracy. Or as Marjorie Taylor, Taylor here in the United States claims, the fires in California have been engineered by a Jewish cabal from outer space that's sending lasers into the forest yeah. to basically destroy the forest. This is an elected individual. Okay. So I mean, if you really want to talk about manufactured ignorance and whether or not it's real, think about those examples. Wow, yeah. And that, that's certainly a very placative example. Do you think she could be helped at all through education? No, I don't. No, I, I, I think that one of the things that we have to realize is that you know, Adorno had a great phrase. He, he said, when needs become sedimented, we're not just talking about rationality. We're talking about a lived experience that creates an almost a Reichian sense, a kind of character armor that's going to take a long time to crack, mm. you know, a long time to break open, get into, talk about, rationalize. This is not about rationality. This is where you have to understand the limits of rationality. Right. But at the same time, hope that there are people who still believe enough in rationality and enlightenment that you can talk to, who basically can move beyond these people and create relations of power and modes of collective resistance that will challenge that nonsense. Wow. Yeah. 
I mean, you, you paint kind of a very dark picture for rationality, but at the same time, let's let's say just over the past year and a half, just since this pandemic has really taken hold. Um, I mean, you say this technocratic rationality has really taken hold. I mean, everyone talks about what is the right thing to do, what is what is rational, and um, how, how, the, the, how do you explain that tension then, or how, what does it look I, I like? Think it, I mean, look, I'm not talking about the end of rational thought. Hmm. I'm talking about its limits. I'm, I'm talking about how, for instance, right, how, how people who are who are basically isolated and alone. Um, uh, become part of a culture that initially is not racist. There's an appeal to music, there's an appeal to community, there's an appeal to basic human needs. And all of a sudden, they find themselves in what they see as a family. They find themselves at, uh, amidst social bonds at a company and bam, all of a sudden now it's like, and by the way, uh, watch out for black people, right? They, they're really gonna invade your neighborhood. So I guess what I'm, what I'm curious about I'm curious about the relationship between basic social human needs and rationality and how they can come together as an empowering force, as opposed to uh, assuming that rationality is always on the side of justice. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do we talk about rationality being subverted and how do we talk about that as a political and educational project? That's the key. Right. If you wanna talk about it simply in economic terms, in terms of structures of domination, I think that's okay, but you're missing something. And, and I think the thing that we're, we're missing here is how do we begin to talk to people in ways in which they can recognize themselves? What does it mean to talk to people who basically have become unknowable? What does it mean to talk to people who are outside, who are, have been relegated to, so, to zones of social abandonment? How do we talk about consciousness in a way in which people can in, engage in modes of identification where they can all of a sudden make connections they haven't made before. That's an educational project that's utterly political because what it suggests at its core, Max, is that education is always a, a, a battle over agency, always. Mm -hmm. That's why it's political, right? It's a battle over agency, it's a battle over how you and I relate to ourselves, how we relate to other people, and how we relate to the larger world. Mm -hmm. That basically is an argument about how we relate the present to the future, and what role will play in shaping that? Utterly perfect. Right. Um, there are a number of questions that come up for me just now. I mean, you mentioned agency, which is which is hugely uh, interesting in, in that context, especially kind of seeing how how agency is or isn't produced by education. But um, maybe just briefly before that, uh, you mentioned kind of the, the idea of recognizing oneself as, as a person who is isolated and certainly I can see how how the the pandemic and its rationality would kind of exacerbate feelings of isolation by kind of taking away the middle layer if that makes sense of direct uh, human uh, relating to to each other um, but 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 what do you mean recognizing oneself how do you uh, how, how do you how would you break that down kind of from the theoretical level I think that let me give you a, a, a relatively, hopefully, unabstract formulation. I think you have to make something to be transformed. I think that's what it means is that you have to begin to understand where people are, what their problems are, what kind of experience they have that shape lives. And you have to try to relate those experiences through some Right. Uh, I was asking you earlier before the connection broke down about uh, that expression that you use and um, people recognizing themselves and, and how that uh, how that could look, uh, perhaps if you can give an example or something. I, I mean, I, I think that what I'm trying to say is that people have to be able to invest something of themselves in the kinds of narratives that are being addressed to them. They have to be able to recognize something about their lives, their experiences, the conditions in which they find themselves, so that basically we can, it becomes possible to be provocative enough to rupture the kind of normalizing assumptions that harden their views of the world. Black people are dangerous, mm. for instance, right? Or I don't have a job because, um, 
the immigration policies are threatening my job. Uh, schools are being defunded because they're, they're just failing and they're stupid, as opposed to being defunded because all public goods are being defunded under neoliberal ideologies and policies. And so it, it, it seems to me that, I mean, how do you awaken in people a notion of identification in which you can stretch a sense of their own possibilities, while at the same time, uh, promoting a sense of critical reflection. Sometimes that happens with a new language. And, and I'll give you a, a very simple example. I mean, the women's movement in the 1960s and 70s invented a term. They called it date rape. And all of a sudden that term opened up a, a whole series of assumptions about what happens to women in violence in, and when they go on dates that was never assumed to, to be a violation. So it, it, it seems to me, or when, when, you, when you talk about, uh, when you bring together, when you say something like, hey, look, if you schools are failing not because they're, they're stupid or in inadequate, they're failing because they're public. Mm. There's a war going on, and that war is on public goods. That war is on the common good. That war is on the welfare state. Or you say to people, hey, look, you know, university students are fighting for tuition, for free education for instance, but that's not just about students, that's about a fight for social goods, for social provisions for everybody. The state has a responsibility. Or you say, hey, look, governments don't have to serve simply the financial elite. You know, they can make education free, they can provide free health care. They can do all kinds of things that make our lives better because they focus on the social contract. I mean, it seems to me that sometimes you can inject a new language into a, a conversation, into a narrative that relates to people's problems. And all of a sudden, connections are made, Matt, that are never made before. I mean, the problem I have with language, the, the language of individualism, uh, neoliberalism, is that A, it individualizes problems, and B, it separates them. There are no connections. You know, when we talk about war abroad, we don't talk about the war at home. Mm. When you talk about police violence, you don't talk about the police being militarized. Right. As a result of a war culture that militarizes everything. Right. So, so essentially, what you're saying is that you, you have to give people the opportunity to kind of see things in connection. You have to. They, they, first, they have to recognize that it's relevant to their life. Let me give you a small example. Okay. It, it, and I hope this. This is the five second version. My father was a factory worker, and one day, students for a democratic society came to his factory. And he worked among chemicals that were not regulated and horrible and, and actually died eventually because of caught cancer, lung cancer. And he came home to me one day and he said, you hear this guy, Mao Zedong? I said, what? He said, yeah, some Chinese guy. Some guys came to my factory today talking to me about this Chinese guy. He said, why aren't they talking to me about the, the pollution in the factory? Why aren't they talking to me about raising wages? You know, why aren't they talk to me, talking to me about unionizing this place? He said, who the hell is this guy? You, you get it? Right? I, I mean, so it, it seems to me that when you begin to understand people's lives and you understand that a politics of identification is crucial and you recognize that in order to move people, they have to invest something, of, see something of themselves in your discourse. Right. Yeah. But I mean, this... <laughs> Yeah, sorry. The, your your example sounds like that, that sounds like a very classical uh, kind of instance of uh, critical consciousness, or kind of uh, call it whatever. I mean, this is a super plakative example of class consciousness, for example. I would say you know, people coming to the factories trying to trying to show workers worldwide that they all share the same or very similar concerns. But uh, do you think that's that's still the case today? Because it, it seems to me, it doesn't seem to me necessarily like the problem is that people are not engaged with uh, the goings on of the world, or how they, that they would be unaware, for example, of uh, who today's Mao Zedong would be. No, I I think the problem today is twofold. I mean, I, I think the problem today is that in in many ways, uh, the question of language and education and pedagogy are not taken seriously by the left, although they take seriously the notion of multiple forms of oppression somehow either being isolated or connected. I mean, there's a youth movement that now is raising new hopes around all of those issues. And I, and I think that uh, the, the, the major issue here is why aren't questions of agency and questions of narration and questions of language and questions of education itself, why aren't they central to a politics that these people basically are occupying? Right. I mean, when you look at even cultural studies in the 
in, in, at its heyday in the 80s and the 90s. One of the few people who was really talking about uh, pedagogy was Stuart Hall. I mean, you know, cultural studies people actually put out a book of terms that matter and left out education. And yet cultural studies emerged out of workers' education with Raymond Williams and others who were basically talking to workers. So it, it, it seems to me that it's not that uh, people don't understand the variety of issues. And it's not that people don't understand that you have to talk to people to get them to be, to, 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 you know, to change their consciousness. What, what is missed is the notion of a mass critical consciousness being engineered in places in which education is on the side of domination and re not really on the side of empowerment. And how do we want to talk about that? What does that mean in terms of a strategy for social change? What does it mean for a more dialectical understanding of education as a central facet of politics itself? Right, right. I wanted to ask you about that actually, because I think you, you've just uh, alluded pretty strongly to kind of the issue of identity politics and kind of movements today being uh, raising, like you say, ropes around, uh, about, around oppression, kind of intersectional oppression, for example. Um, but I wanted to ask you actually about your opinion on, on, on this general focus on identity politics. Do you well, I have, I have two opinions I, that, that, I, that may be uh, unworthy of a discussion. But I, I think the first opinion is that identity politics has done a great service over the course of the last 40 years in recognizing forms of oppression that basically have been hidden from view. Hmm. Whether we're talking, as you know. Whether, whether we're talking about ecological issues, gay rights, I mean, they, they've moved away from a kind of uh, crude sort of econom economistic view in which there's only one form of oppression and that's it, right? Hmm. The other side of this and my more critical view is that, uh, you know, we, we really have to understand how identity politics in some ways has caused a fragmentation and fracturing among the left that has prevented uh, these groups from coming together and, and, and creating massive social movements united under the banner of, let's say, democratic socialism, mm. under the banner of radical democracy. I mean, you know, you can, you, you can not hate women and not hate blacks and still hate democracy, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, I, I mean, so, you know, th this, this notion of trying to bring the threads together that unite these groups while not underestimating the modes of identity politics and how important they are as single issue movements is fine because mm -hmm. democracy is expansive, it's unfinished and all forms of oppression undo it in some ways. But at the same time, if we can't bring these groups together, if we can't develop an, uh, an international movement for, for the defense of democratic socialism and public goods, and, and move beyond boundaries and being able to talk to each other and organize, as for instance, the Black Lives Matter movement is doing, you know, joining up with Palestinian youth mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. The young people are very smart on this, very international in many ways, but they're often at odds with established forms of identity politics mm -hmm. that in some way border on becoming not only exclusive in a way that mimics neoliberal ideology, uh, but actually exercises a kind of silencing that is creeps into really obscene forms of essentialism. Mm. Like, um, like what? What do you? What like, do you... like you can only speak if you're a woman about feminism. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. If you have to be black to talk about racism. Yeah. I mean, I think it's nonsense. Just utter nonsense. I mean, and I and I think it's unproductive. I think it's anti-democratic, and I think it's dangerous because I think that when biology drives politics, you better think very carefully about what the endpoint of that is. Yeah, certainly. I mean, that, that absolutely sounds like it is kind of a discourse of atomization, like you say, that is very reminiscent of kind of the, the individualization or the reduction of social problems to individual uh, to the individual level that, that you describe in neoliberalism. No? I, I mean, that's very smart because that's the link that has to be made. You always have to ask yourself, in what way are we mimicking elements of neoliberal ideology? but yet putting on a radical uh, patina over this that makes it sound as if this is emancipatory, mm, right. right? I mean, neoliberalism is seductive. You know, it's seductive in terms of its language, right? It talks about freedom, it talks about individualism, it talks about uh, you know, economic, uh, you know, economic well-being. 
Uh, you know, th these are all subdiffusions that really hide an amazingly oppressive, dysfunctional uh, form of domination. Right, but, but I mean, some of these even outright neoliberal uh, appropriations of, let's say, identity politics, they do seemingly manage to give people something that they can recognize. I mean, right yes. now it's, it's Pride Month, for example, and a lot of people talk about rainbow capitalism. And, and I, I uh, know, for example, many people from the LGBTQI plus community were quite happy with that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there are, I mean, neoliberalism is always happy when it can produce a, pro a, a, a progressive image that never challenges relations of power. <laughs> no, no, of you know, I mean, it's always like, oh, look at, you know, it's funny. I mean, I, I'll give talks and, you know, as a working class kid, there's always some kid in the back, male or female, who say, God, you made it. You made it, see? And I said, yeah. And the rest of my neighborhood didn't. I made it because I got lucky. I was a basketball player. That's how I made it. Uh, but no, I, I'm sorry. You know, these are systemic problems. These are, these are not problems in which you can simply overlook the structural nature of capitalism and the misery and inequality it causes by saying, oh, look, we have a black tennis player now, or we have a black vice provost. That's, you know, or an Indian provost. I mean, it's nonsense. It's just, it, it doesn't really get at the heart of the issue. It's diversionary. And uh, in the end, it's, uh, it, it's utterly regressive in its politics. Right. Um, it doesn't challenge hierarchies, whether they're economic, they're racial or political. I guess that's what I really want to say. Hmm. Yeah, I know that, that that makes a lot of sense. I and mean, this is this is something that I've thought myself as well very, very frequently. But uh, do you see any um, maybe just very fundamental theoretical link between uh, this this concept of identity that is being uh, being constructed and agency? Uh, well, I, I'll tell you, some of the links that I see are disturbing. Uh, I, I mean, you know, my, my wife, Rania, has reminded me that, uh, you know, you live in a time when all of a sudden we have a proliferation of happy, the ethos of happiness. Hmm. You, know, you know, we're now a happiness culture, right? Like, you, you, are, you, are, you, are you oppressed? Learn how to be happy. You know, uh, learn, you know let, let's take the language of therapy where you can find yourself, feel good emotional uplift, uh, talk to people who, who basically won't upset you, uh, you know, and, and, I, and I think that those kinds of links, to say the very least, outside of reducing people to simply consumers, there's now an attempt to play with people's emotions in ways that are enormously regressive because they constrict questions of agency in which they collapse the political into the personal. Right. Yeah. And now on the other side of this is, which is where I think I, I, I think you're going. Uh, no, there are notions of agency that in, in some way, whether you're talking about gay rights, are you, are you talking about ecological justice or that expand the notion of citizenship outside of the sphere of the mall, hmm. uh, outside of the sphere of consumerism to the degree that agency can be politicized. I'm, I'm there. I support that as long as it doesn't become siloed, fractured, exclusive, essentialist, and basically can't make the leap to larger definitions of democracy that would entertain difference along with questions of social equity, social justice, and it seems to me notions of collective freedom. Right, okay. I mean, this again comes to a to a head kind of during the pandemic. I mean, just having been uh, here at Oxford the entire time, it, the, the focus that people who are supposed to run structures of support for students, for example, put on mental health now is astonishing. Yeah. Um, and, and but at the same time, you see very, very little sort of stirring um, where people say, well, maybe this is maybe it's a rational response to be depressed. Maybe, maybe this is due to kind of structural, structural problems and maybe I can't do anything about it. And at the end of the day, you know, going to therapy won't solve anything. Look, let, let's, let's, let's even get a little more real here. You know, I mean, if, if we want to talk about depression, let's talk about people for whom time is a deprivation rather than a luxury. Mm. Let's talk about people who basically get, whose agency is defined exclusively by such a narrow range of choices that they're making a choice between medicine and bread and food for their children, right? Then let's talk about what choice means when the conditions in which they're imposed 
outside of the possibility of individual change. That's the issue. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it, there's, there's something about inherent in your example that speaks to a notion of freedom that is so narrow, so individualized, so regressive, so scleric, uh, that it actually depoliticizes people. You know, mental health becomes a frame of mind, mm. right? That's it. And what can we do to address this crisis? Well, be certainly there is. What? Be more mindful. Down yeah, be more mindful. Sure exactly. I, mean, I mean, certainly there is a crisis in which people feel alone, anxious. It's a crisis of precarity. And that precarity is a crisis of a pathological form of capitalism. It seems to me that let's, let's name the problem. Pathologies beget mental health problems. Pathologies ruin people's lives. Pathologies put people in a position where they have very little choices over the control of their labor, the conditions of their lives, and the ability to survive. In the United States, three individuals control half the wealth of the entire bottom half of the population. So if we really want to talk about problems, let's talk about inequality and what it means. And let's talk about what freedom means in the midst of one of the most massive inequitous systems that the world has ever seen, particularly with respect to the question of choice and constraints, because neoliberalism operates off the assumption and it's more milder forms in universities and other places operate off the assumption that the real issue here is choice, but it's always a choice without constraints. Mm without the, uh, an analysis of structural, ideological, political constraints. And it's also an analysis that eliminates from politics questions of social and moral responsibility. And I'll give you the essence of that. You and I live in a system where economic activity is removed from social cost. Think about it. Mm. That erases questions of social and ethical responsibility. That what means- Economic you, activity, you mean? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it erases questions of how activity is boasted by or should be and be aware of the consequences of its actions. <laughs> I mean, that, that's really a pathological society, to say the very least. And economic systems that teach that are criminogenic. I mean, I really believe the Harvard Business School is criminogenic. It's a criminogenic environment. I mean, it, it creates people who are basically zombies, who feed off the blood of democracy. They're out of us for the walking dead. I'm not sure if Oxford's like that. I mean, I have a feeling it is. I may be wrong. Uh, maybe it's a, these elitist schools have a compunction of social responsibility because they feel that all of you have to be more broad-minded in terms of the consequences of your actions. I'm not sure. But, uh, but it seems to me that there's, uh, you know, as you move up the racial higher, as you move up the the, the class hierarchy, the, the the possibility for pathology becoming normalized becomes more powerful. Right. I mean, um, they certainly talk a lot about um, about uh, social responsibility. So I think they are making an effort. I don't know. I mean, it's perhaps at Oxford specifically, it's not as as structurally uh, clear why the things happen the way they happen. So this is certainly as an institution, very conservative. That's not to say that the people are, but I also wonder about this frequently because there's no head honcho that runs the university that makes it run the way that it does. It does so because it's a structure that has grown over 800 years and the collegiate structure sometimes makes it almost impossible to make any decisions. People don't even really know who can change something. You know, let me let me also qualify something because in the spirit of Adorno, who once said, "In the exaggerations, there are truths." Of course, I know. I know how, how you mean what you're saying. I, I, I share many of your concerns. In places like Oxford, in places like Harvard, and in places like McMaster, hmm. there are always spaces of resistance. Domination is never complete, and oftentimes you'll find the overall structure of those places, as we well know, is really entirely conservative. But they leave room sometimes willingly, sometimes uh, to their, to, to, to their uh, chagrin mm. for people who are smart, people who have a sense of social responsibility, people who are doing enormously good work. And I'm sure that happens at Oxford. I'm sure it happens at all of these schools. And those spaces have to be enlarged. And that's one of the things that we have to struggle for. We have to recognize that these institutions are institutions of, are sites of struggle. They're very important. 
probably one of the few civic institutions left in which civic culture can be defended, in which civic culture can in some way be reclaimed, in which notions of shared citizenship can be promoted, in which a, a, a culture of self-absorption can be eliminated mm -hmm. in some way. So I don't want to sound too dogmatic about that. I'm sorry. I, I, no, I, was, no, not at all. I was getting carried away. No, not at all. I also, I, I'm not from here, you know, I, I joined two years ago, I came actually from, from Amsterdam, the University of Amsterdam before, which is a very, very activist university. Yeah, of course you know. it is, yes, yes. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, not quite as much as it used to be, but uh, there were some minor occupations while I was there. Um, but uh, I, I actually think that, the, that this, the consciousness is there. I mean, people here are very, very involved with sort of social justice issues and they really want to 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 be activists but yeah i mean it, it just just maybe this is interesting to you it always crystallizes around um it seems to me at least kind of single issues so for example there's a statue of cecil rhodes at the oriel college that is now the subject of controversy for the better part of a decade but um but, but i see I, I mean i i think even even those issues have the opportunity to, to, to open up, I, I, I think, larger, larger considerations, right? I mean, because the road statue, rather than being torn down and just forgotten, is part of a, a notion of historical remembrance that should spark an enormous, and I'm sure it does, an enormous debate about, about slavery, an enormous debate about injustice. And then we should ask ourselves, where, what's the place for those statues? Where should they go? Well, they should go in a museum of injustices, right? Where, where in fact, people can learn how historical rem remembrance is so crucial. Remember in the United States right now, as you well know, uh, something like 25 states are trying to ban all references to critical race theory. I was going to ask you about that, yeah. Trying to ban any reference to slavery, claiming that it's at odds with patriotic education. And I guess I point to that because it goes back to a question you had raised earlier. And that question was, well, do they really take education seriously in ways that would allow them to shape uh, young people's sense of agency and control the conditions of labor of faculty in both public and higher education? in ways that would turn education into a factory of, of silencing, mm. a factory of conformity. Absolutely. There's no question. The right understands very clearly what education, the power education has. I was at a conference in Amsterdam not too, about five years ago where somebody actually stood up and said, social justice is the enemy of democracy. Actually said that. And he was the former dean of Boston University and the former commissioner of uh, education in, in New York City. I mean, these are powerful people who are not simply delusional. Mm. They're very uh, energized right. around their mission educationally, very energized. What do they think their, their mission is or what is education to them or what should it be? Education to them is about training. Education to them uh, uh, makes its uh, makes its point on the side of, of eliminating critical fact faculties, uh, shutting down the power of the imagination, undermining civic culture, eradicating any notion of the social, eliminating notions of solidarity, and providing students with the tools they need not to have to think about the power of the social contract and what that means in terms of their own responsibility as active and engaged critical citizenship. Citizenship for them is the enemy of democracy. Mm. That's what they want. They want a form of education and citizenship that basically is about training, that about produces people for the workforce. That's what they want. I mean, they want, they want a culture of conformity. They want a culture that basically undermines the public imagination and basically eliminates any notion of civic justice. Right. So why, why would they think, want- I don't think I'm exaggerating on that, to be honest. Personally, I don't think you are at all. Um, but but why, why would these people want universities at all then? I mean, what, what, what tangible value does university education add? I, I, I think, to be honest with you, uh, if, if you look at the head of Mike, the former head of Microsoft, uh, Bill Gates, I mean, he believes that basically these institutions should be eliminated, that everything should be online, right. that we don't really need libraries. I mean, libraries are on their way out. 
we don't really need faculty. I mean, they can all be online and they can be on part-time contracts. In the United States, 70% of all faculty are part-time. Many of them are on welfare. Uh, they don't make enough money, be it teaching three or four courses a week. So it seems to me that when you say, how, do, how, do, how, how might one feel about the destruction of the university? That's already taken place. Mm. The university is already is, is being destroyed on a massive level across the globe. Yeah. I mean, we, we look at Afghanistan where you know, young girls who basically want to get educated get beheaded and tortured. Ask yourself, what's the end point of an authoritarian logic in which education is so dangerous that we will kill people who basically go for it? Remember, in, in the history of fascism, the first thing, fascism starts with language. And then it starts with the politics of disappearance. The intellectuals, the communists, those people who are disabled. And it seems to me what we're seeing on a massive level under neoliberalism is the disappearance of civic education. We're seeing a, the disappearance of the education, of education as a democratic public sphere. I don't think education has ever been in such a crisis as it is at this point in the 21st century. And the only hope that I see is your generation. I think young people are recognizing how important it is. They're fighting for it. They realize that education does not just take place in schools. They're more international. They're connecting issues. And they're putting their bodies on, 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 on the streets. You know, they realize they're in a war culture. The global culture today is not just simply a competitive culture, it's a militarized war culture. Everybody's a soldier. Everybody's armed. All public spaces are now open to the politics of violence and violence is really the only solution by which we can address important social issues. Oh, well, that's bleak. <laughs> it's bleak, but it, 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 it's only bleak in the sense that it names the problem. And the problem sounds bleak, but you can't attack the problem until you see it. If you don't understand the forces that are at work in dark times, then you can't fight them. So I don't see that description as saying there's no hope. I see that as saying that's the beginning of hope. Right. Yeah. You make the problem visible, then you fight it. That's not about the collapse of resistance. That's about, about resistance getting smart. Yeah, of course. But, but what can be done, let's say, just in a limited uh, arena then of the university, for example? What can, if you say that uh, our generation's students are, are the solution, what can they do? I think they need to shut down the universities. That's what I think they need to do. Yeah. That's, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm a child of the 60s. We shut down the universities. Well, they got shut down. They occupy the universities. I think they have to negotiate. When they can't negotiate, shut them down. Right. Demonstrate. Because remember, under neoliberal logic, you're a client. Mm. You supply money, you know, you supply, I mean, I mean you know, that the generation of students, that's a source of income. Take away the income, see what happens. It isn't as if there, there isn't, there aren't tools that can be used for negotiating, even the most drastic tool. I'm not for violence. I'm not arguing for violence. I'm arguing for nonviolent behavior that basically can create a crisis that opens up a different kind of dialogue. Right. But it's, and we it's also suggest at the same time, that students and faculty have power. Hmm. And they have that power in solidarity, not only with each other, but also with unions, with larger social movements. Hmm. That's, that's the way it works. Right. But if, if I mean, that, that sounds very much kind of like the classical playbook. I mean, I'm, I, I sympathize with it. I mean, having personally kind of sympathized with it before. So like I said, in Amsterdam, we've done the, these exact same things. It's just that you describe a world that has changed. Neoliberalism has taken hold more strongly. It is militarized society. Like you say, everyone is a soldier. Uh, violence is uh, more or less visible everywhere now. I could see how, how it, that has become more pronounced with the pandemic because state control now penetrates aspects that neoliberalism before maybe wouldn't touch of the individual. Look, uh, look, 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 you're a smart guy. There's just been a revolution in Peru. You know, mm -hmm. all of a sudden the leftist government is in power. You know, people who are basically peasants have now changed relations of power in that country. Trump was defeated, uh, uh, even though we have a, a centrist now in power. I mean, it, it, it seems to me I'm always amazed by the potential of collective resistance. And, and while I mentioned to you one strategy with respect to ch changing the university, at the same time, I'm also looking at strategies emerging all over the world that are being defined through different languages and a different kind of politics, a politics of intersectionality, 
a mm. politics of solidarity, a politics that actually is tuned into something I've never seen before. And that is an enormous sense of urgency because the planet is at risk. Human life is at risk. We have reached the end point of the machinery of political, economic, and social death. The, the, the end point is not 50 years away, it's 10 years away. And it seems to me that young people are unwilling to cancel out the future. And in that, though, in that there's room for new strategies. There's room for new kinds of dialogues. There's room for a new understanding of the university, a new understanding of education. Look, think about George Floyd's murder. The largest demonstrations in history, Matt's, in history took place across the globe. Now, demonstrations for me are pedagogical events. What we really need is the long march through the institutions. Pedagogical events enlighten people, but what you then need is, in terms of the next step in strategy, are organizations that counter power and don't just disappear in 24 hours. That's the great challenge. Right. That's yeah. the great challenge that this generation is facing. Right. Those those movements, they're certainly there. I see them as well. I'm just struggling to see how they translate into politics or democratic politics, like you say. I mean, would, would you say that, for example, uh, the election of Joe Biden is a result of, of those demonstrations of the murder of George Floyd? I, I think there are two elements to, to think about here. I think that for people on the left, you have to think in terms of a, a, an immediate liberal strategy that changes people's lives right off, i.e., you cancel Trump's position on food stamps mm -hmm. so that 15 more million kids will not starve to death. I'm for that, absolutely, no question. Expanding social provisions that immediately help the poor, no question. That's one foot in, I have one foot in. We should have one foot in to make sure that we can alleviate the immediacy of the suffering that people face. I support Biden on that, I, but I have one foot out. And the other foot out says, Capitalism has to go. Sorry. That's the long struggle. We increasingly have to make people aware that capitalism and democracy are not the same. They're not the same. That capitalism is about the concentration of power in the hands of relatively few people that has reached the end point. It's the end point, right? And that politics now is global. And, 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 it, and it seems to me with power, I'm sorry, power is, is, is global and politics is local. Hmm. You know, we're fighting on local terrains, but power is somewhere else. It's, it's, you know, it's in a global miasma that we've got to learn how to challenge with international organizations. And I think that realization is starting to come, become clear. I mean, look, the, the, the setbacks in the fossil fuel, fuel industry in the last few weeks, yeah. boy, I'll tell you, that's colossal. You know, yeah. you know, I remember some a poet who once said, well, you know, whoever thought that the divine right of kings would come to an end? <laughs> yeah. And who would think that capitalism can, it can come to an end? You know, I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I don't want to, this is not a notion of hope that's Disney-like or romanticized, but it's a notion of hope for which there is no alternative to have hope because the alternative is cynicism. But at the same time, it has to be grounded in real struggles that recognize how hard this is to, to achieve. Right. So there are then, like, like you clearly say, there are ways, there are people who have critical consciousness, but at the same time, I mean, in your work, you describe the deconstruction of education to the point where it doesn't foster critical consciousness at all anymore. So- but No, what, what, I'm, what I'm arguing is that uh, we have to realize the centrality of education in terms of supporting a system that normalizes its own illegitimate behavior so we can fight it. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Sorry for collapsing it. Yeah, of course. Education is not some sideshow. You know, no. that you, know, you read a book and you try to educate people, or Rania, my wife, you know, goes out and teaches a class that, that is critical and alive. No, it's something else. I mean, it, it's very central to the struggle of individual and collective agency is now being waged to put matters of resistance on the forefront of struggle. That's what we're talking about. So I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, all I'm saying is that. You know, we have to recognize that education is political and it's about domination. It's not just about social justice and raising critical consciousness. I'm sorry. If, if you want to believe that, you're in trouble, right? No, of course. Yeah, no. But then you'll dis dismiss education as schooling. 
Mm. You know, oh yeah, kids should be smart. You know, no, they shouldn't just be smart. I'm sorry. They should be active. They should be engaged. They should take a chance, take risks. They should learn how to be provocative. James Baldwin said, you get educated to make trouble. I agree. Right. You make yeah. trouble. Yeah. No, sorry, so, sorry for collapsing it down, kind of one placative term. That's, that's not what I meant to do. It's just, I mean, the obvious criticism there would be that that people who maybe are not on, on the same uh, on the same side politically as you would just say that you're asking for education to be essentially what they would call indoctrination. I, I, I think that indoctrination is completely, at a, I, I think there are two issues. I, I think that indoctrination refers to a form of pedagogy that basically depoliticizes people and normalizes their own sense of injustice or the injustices they experience. But I think education for to promote forms of agency, which allow people to learn how to govern rather than be governed, is of a, a very different register. And I think we need to make that distinction. And I also think that we need to make a distinction between political education and politicizing education. Mm -hmm. Political education operates in the, I would think, in the interest of empowerment giving people all the skills and the knowledge and the histories they need to be able to make decisions about how to control their lives in the midst of the conditions that bear down on them. Politicizing education says, there's only one way and it's my way. Yeah. Sorry, you know, I mean, that's propaganda, right? I mean, it says that you don't deserve to be an agent. You don't deserve to think for yourself. I'm a, what did Trump say, for instance? I mean, during the, 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 the 2016 election, he said, don't think I like the uneducated. He said, I will do it for you. I will, that's it. You know, that's the kind of, that's propaganda. I mean, that's an education where you don't have a choice and you're not asked to think through choices. Hmm, yeah. But then, I mean, you're, you're assuming that people will come under the influence of free education that teaches them how to govern rather than being governed will come to the same conclusions that they would like to eliminate oppression Maybe, you know, maybe. I, I, I don't I don't think there's any political guarantees, but I know this. I know that the outcomes that you'd like to see in terms of what it means to create education, educated citizens, it's not going to take place without that. Right. Yeah. No. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, this is not an education with political guarantees. If you believe that you're an idiot. Right. <laughs> and, and if you believe that you're, you're also imposing uh, an ideological prescription on your own pedagogy. Yeah, that yeah. seems to suggest it can't fail, and therefore you can't learn from its failures. Yeah. Yeah. But what, 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 I, what I mean to allude more to maybe is the, the fact that a lot of these positions that, that people on the left, like you and Ro, like, like I, uh, would, would criticize vehemently and would say just obviously are oppressive and wrong, they are also defended very seemingly rationally by people in academia and people who are very educated. I and mean, economics, for example, is a prime example. There is essentially no mainstream alternative to kind of neoclassical neoliberal economics there's no there's, that's an institutional question right that's not just a question of rationality that's a question of politics and power as you well know i mean that that's that that's why we ask ourselves why is there a business section in the new in the newspaper but no labor section i mean that's about the politics of disappearance i mean that's about a politics that is basically not faced opposition strong enough to challenge a curriculum that is almost entirely neoliberal and claims it's about free market fundamentalism and nothing else. That's a struggle that people have to wage to change. Now, remember, you know, I, I mean, maybe I'm too old for this, but there was a time when you, you did not have any kind of minority based education in the universities. The, the, you didn't have the history of the civil rights. You didn't, well, now that stuff is flourishing in many places. That's why the right is so crazy over this. You know, one of the reasons it's so crazy is because all of a sudden there has been an enormous amount of success in women's studies, gay studies. I mean, they're under attack, but they're under attack because they were successful. Right. Yeah. They, they, I mean, they're under attack because these subjects, this expansion of, of the curriculum in democratic, towards a democratic orientation has basically been the outcome of struggles, Max, mm -hmm. right? You don't want to underestimate those struggles simply because the forces of tyranny now are more visible and more confident than they may have been in the past. That just means we struggle harder. Right. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. I want. I wanted to ask you about that, but you've already answered the question. But uh, yeah, I, I suppose the, the mainstream system it has this power to subsume these histories of struggle. We already talked about kind of rainbow capitalism, where now you have. Uh, you have police floats at pride parades when the, the first stone at Stonewall was thrown at a policeman and those sorts of things. Um, yeah, I'm still kind of struggling to see, see hope as a young person, honestly. Maybe I'm just 
I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, pessimistic or too depressed or the mental health industry has gotten to me already. But... No, I, I think there are two things, and I, and I certainly am not speaking for you. I, I can't do that. But I'll tell you what I see among my students that I find interesting, you know, and, it's, and it refers to something that you had brought up earlier that I wish I had responded to immediately to, to put in a kind of context. In the age of the pandemic, which has now magnified the age of precarity for your generation, there's a double bind. And that double bind is around isolation. Right. In medical terms, we're told that you have to isolate to save human lives. But nobody talks about the fact that against that call to isolation, there is a system that is increasingly before the pandemic said that basically we're all isolated, we're all individuals, and the last thing that you want to do is engage in any form of solidarity because that's both a sign of weakness and a sign that uh, you're, you're not strong and that you are somehow incapable of dealing with the challenges that you're going to face in life. In that contradiction, there's the possibility for a different kind of language and an eruption, meaning that all of a sudden the connectiveness that was disabled under neoliberalism now becomes essential to any notion of solidarity and democratic life because we're experiencing an isolation that was forced upon us by a virus and a political system in its worst ways. Mm -hmm. And to me, that offers up a space of translation. But at the same time, we bear the, the, the burden, the living burden of experiencing this isolation against a, a default sense of community that has plagued us for generations. Mm -hmm. This is a difficult moment to translate, but it's a moment of possibility. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we should be depressed and allow the depression of being isolated to sort of suggest that's a mark of powerlessness that basically now is difficult to challenge because the pandemic will end. Mm -hmm. At least the viral pandemic will be modified. Let's put it that way. And things will open up again and new questions will be raised about the nature of work, about the nature of the university, about the nature of solidarity, about the nature of community, about the nature of consumerism and what we need and don't need, about the nature of systemic racism. All of these issues are coming to the forefront under the aegis of the pandemic that basically, while it tries to constrain those, those issues, cannot completely control them. Right. And in that, I think there's hope. Okay, so, so earlier it sounded as if you were saying that, or also from, from reading some of, of your latest book, it sounded like you, you meant to say that the pandemic was somehow playing into the cards of, of the neoliberal establishment. Now it sounds like you're saying that it's actually- well, I'm, saying, I'm saying two things. I'm saying that the pandemic at one level opens up enormous possibilities because it makes contradictions visible in capitalism that allows us to realize if you want to study fascism, you have to study capitalism. Secondly, the pandemic has reinforced, reproduced, and tried to energize elements of neoliberalism that have basically failed. And in doing so, uh, certainly there's more systemic oppression with intellectuals being thrown out of schools, schools being put online, and so forth and so on. But I don't see that as something that's undoable. I see that as something that presents a challenge that we haven't seen before because it's so magnified. Right. Yeah, that, 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 that's nice, actually. That is, that is much more hopeful than I anticipated. Oh, no, no, I, I, I'm not. I'm, believe me when I tell you, uh, you know, I, I don't believe in doom and gloom. And I, and I don't believe in a, a language of critique without a language of possibility. And I, and I don't believe that we should ever allow ourselves to inhabit a theoretical framework in which domination occupies and only occupies every space of possibility. I think that's a dead end. Mm -hmm. There was resistance even in the camps mm -hmm. under the worst of conditions. I mean, so I'm a great believer in resistance. I'm a great believer in the notion of collective agency. And I'm a great believer in what Marx once said. He said, history is open. Yeah, yeah, that's certainly true. That's certainly true. So then maybe as a kind of question to wrap it up, because I see that we're kind of running out of time, we could, I, I could personally go on forever, but we'll kind of have to take uh, some, have to, you know, still stick to the constraints. Um, the eternal question, what is to be done? 
what, I think can we, what, what can we do in concrete action kind of what should the relationship of theory and praxis be in the months and the months to come the years to come for everyone I, I think that in, in in the months to come I think that people are going to have to realize that the basic problems that we face in this country are enormously urgent and that in some countries such as the United States they're tipping into the abyss of, of fascism hmm. maybe not so much with Biden as with the Republican Party that has now become a party of white supremacists is he going to be able to stem the tide I'm not sure I'm not sure I, I, I think that the 2022 election will certainly speak to the degree to which people on the left and progressives can mobilize people around issues that matter in their lives and be able to push back the voter suppression the attack on education the attack on schools the attack on critical thought and so forth and so on so i think that in the first instance this thing has to be recognized for its seriousness secondly it, it seems to me that we have to wage a massive educational campaign in all kinds of ways on the part of intellectuals and cultural workers and schools, people who basically are dealing with ideas, to try to renew and re-energize and inspire a sense of the civic imagination and the public imagination. We need to reinvent a new language around the public and around democracy. And we need to make it clear that democracies are fragile and can fail, and that regardless of constitutions and institutions, they're never safe in ways that guarantee their reproduction. Fourthly, we need to reconceive a new notion of uh, collective agency. We need to bring back notions of solidarity that not only speak to civic courage, but speak to bringing together across a range of oppressions, people and groups who can now mobilize a mass movement for democratic socialism. Your generation, believe it or not, 60% claim they're democratic socialists across the globe. This is unreal. Certainly not true in my generation. That gives me hope. That means there's a new language being emer emerging. And I, then I want to go, finally, politics has become image-based. And we've got to, in some way, take advantage of that by not only teaching people how to be cultural critiques, but basically how to be cultural producers. There is a big urge, a whole generation has to learn how to do their own radio programs, has to learn how to create films, has to learn how to take that oracular culture and see it as the center of politics rather than a print culture, which is endemic to my generation. So that means that the platforms for political engagement have to be expanded. And I see that as an enormous possibility. Right. Is the, is, is the internet kind of a creator web 2.0, 3.0 now, the creator-based web of force for good in this? So, say that again? So the, the kind of content creator-based uh, generation of the web, uh, you know, yeah. YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, is that a force for good? I, I think not as long as it's monopolized by <laughs> major corporations, oh. but I think by the degree to which we talk about the social media as being a force for resistance and multiplying those spaces in ways that in which they can both connect and at the same time make themselves the center of a politics engage in both making politics meaningful to make it critical to make it transformative yeah i think that is a force for good right. i i don't want to i don't want to confuse corporatized social media with the power of a media in the hands of people hmm. right and not in the hands of corporations corporations are basically machineries of death social death yeah no, great. So, yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to kind of become one of, at least try to become one of those content creators that you're saying can make. Oh, you, you, you have all the energy and I can tell the sense of civic commitment and certainly the intelligence to do that. No, try. I try not, I would to not be up. surprised at all. <laughs> well, with this, you know, this is this is the, what little we can do. Thank you so much, Professor Giroux, for talking to us. I really, really appreciate it. It's an excellent talk. Hope to talk to you again in the future, maybe. We'll, the future will be even brighter then. Let's hope. And when and you you will send me something when it's done. Oh yeah. yeah.